Hello all and welcome to this new episode of Global Voices on Hard Freedom TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Serra. Today, we will continue with the second part of the cardinal ablation technique. And for that, I'm joined with Professor Jose Carlos Pachon. We talk about many subjects. There are some variations in how to perform the cardinal ablation. Is it necessary to define a standard procedure to perform multicenter study? Do we have many ways to do it, or does it have to be only one way to achieve the cardinal ablation? Thank you very much, Juan. It's a pleasure to be again in this scientific meeting. Uh, cardinal ablation, what is the best strategy? We have to take into account that this Procedure is a new procedure, and there is no definitive uh, way to do, you no know, definitive technique to be performed. So I think the best way is to have a very hard, very good endpoint control. I think it is probably the most important. In order to do the cardioneuroblation, we have several alternatives, like, at, like in the beginning, we used it to ablate the fibrillar myocardium, the atrial fibrillation nest, located by spectral mapping. It is easy to get this kind of uh, asset, the approach. And it's possible also to do the ablation by conventional mapping, looking for specific potentials that may be obtained by specific setup of the filtering of the recorder. So it is easy to get by this way. However, in this case, we have to set up the filtering of the, uh, the recorder in order to see more, uh, to, to make, uh, uh, obviously, to, to to be more precise to uh, detect the atrial fibrillation nest. In this, we, here we can see an example in the upper position, the conventional recording, and in the lower position, there is the, the specific recording of the atrial fibrillation nest. It is easy to get. However, obviously, it is uh, time consuming because we have to ablate all the regions that present specific potential and atrial fibrillation nest. So in the practical world, in the real world, we have the atrial fibrillation nest mapping, but it may be, uh, it may be made easy by the fractionation mapping. So it is, uh, important to, to take into account that there are, there are several uh, mapping techniques to get the, to track the innervation and to get the denervation by ablation, the spectral IF nest mapping or the fractionation mapping. The fractionation mapping uh, is a software that we developed in 2005 uh, in order to get the anatomical, electroanatomical mapping of the atrial fibrillation nest. In this case, the AF nest are tagged, are marked in the electroanatomical model, and it is possible to ablate. Uh, okay, it's possible to do the AF nest conventional mapping, and also it's possible to do the anatomical GP location. Several authors have been doing only anatomical GP location that it is possible to get good results with this approach. In this anatomical GP location, it is necessary to consider that the first uh, GP, it is, is important to, to note that we ablate areas of presumed position of the GPs. So we name it the area one located between the superior vena cava and aorta, the area two that corresponded to GP2 
that is related to the insertion of the right pulmonary veins, the area three uh, related to the insertion of the coronary sinus and the inferior vena cava, and area four related to the insertion of the left pulmonary veins. These locations may are able to allow us to, to do an ablation only by anatomical landmarks. And in this area, uh, in these areas, is is very important to do ablation, very long release of the RF energy in order to get the uh, effect over the epicardial region. It's necessary to cross the atrial wall with the RF energy in order to get ablation of the ganglionated plexi. We have to remember that in the atrial, there are uh, a lot of uh, micro uh, ganglionated plexi that may be ablated by using a higher energy. In this case, it is important to see that the RF ablation may reach uh, until 15 milli millimeters of depth so it is possible to ablate the epicardium by assessing the endocardium. And another very, very important location for ablation during the cardioneural ablation is the area named the P-point. This area is located in the left uh, atrium, in the interatrial septum, in the left side of the interatrial septum, located between the roof of the left atrium, the insertion of the right pulmonary veins, and uh, the fossa ovalis. This area is extremely important because uh, it, it has a lot of ganglionated plexi uh, related to innervation of the sinus node. Ablating this area causes the most important sinus node denervation. So, it, this area must be treated in all cases of cardioneuroablation. Obviously, uh, if we need to expand the ablation to, uh, to map more atrial fibrillation nest, we may use the fractionation mapping. And here we have an example showing in these um, green areas the innervation entry in this case. So in this uh, with this tool, it's possible to enhance and to widen the ablation in order to get the complete elimination of the vagal effect. Independent of the technique that may be used, the best is to have a hard endpoint. The best is to have the control of the vagal effect. So if we are doing anatomical ablation of if you are doing electrophysiological guided ablation, the best is to have the same endpoint. I think it is very important in order to have uh, mood-centric trials that may be, uh, in this case, may be possible uh, in uh, each investigator use the best technique that he is, uh, that he is, um, uh, he's having using. So it is uh, important in this case to see the uh, vagal effect before cardioneurobration and after the cardioneurobration is important to get the elimination, the complete abolishment of the vagal effect. Ho however, if there is no possible to get the vagal effect elimination, it's very important to declare that the vagal effect was not completely eliminated. And it is very important to compare techniques and compare results. Here we can see an example of one case from our uh, service showing that uh, there was a very important vagal effect by uh, uh, ablating the ganglion one, two, three, and after ablating one, two, three, and four area, there was still very 
important vagal response, um, ablating several areas related to the coronary sinus, the waterstone groove, and crystal terminal. There was uh, still a very important vagal effect that was uh, uh, the, the vagal effect in this case was completely eliminated only after ablating uh, several additional atrial fibrillation nests that were located by uh, fractionation mapping. So independent of the technique, the most important is to get the vagal effect elimination. And several authors have been using the high frequency stimulation to, to control the cardioneuroblation. Uh, I think this technique uh, is time consuming and is not completely safe because the high frequency stimulation uh, shows uh, only uh, clusters of innervation. And the extracardiac vagal stimulation shows the whole vagal, uh, the whole vagal stimulation. In this, in this upper uh, scheme, we can see the extracardiac vagal stimulation showing uh, the controlling the denervation of all clusters in the atrial. And in the, uh, this uh, uh, scheme, we can see the uh, high frequency stimulation showing the control of only clusters of the vagal effect. So in, in other words, we can say that the high frequency stimulation show the effect in a branch and the extracardiac vagal stimulation show the effect in the tree, in the whole tree. So it is, in our opinion, it is very important to do the extracardiac vagal stimulation. Excellent. Excellent. I have one last question. This ha there has been several cases published in the HRS case report analyzing levels of denervation in patients with syncope and sinus arrest, but absence of AB block, do we need to treat only the sinus node or do we have to treat or ablate more to treat the AV node too? And this is a tricky question. This is a very, very important question. And I would like to show you this example. In this patient, we perform the, the extracardiac vagal stimulation, and there was um, reproduction of the clinical uh, effect of a very long asystole, and the cardioneurobration was performed, and it was stopped because there was observed a very uh, important increase of the sinus rate. So the, the idea was that the cardioneurobration uh, should be finished because there was a sinus denervation. Uh, in this case, the heart rate increased to 100 beats per minute post the cardioneurobration. However, in this phase, it was per performed, it was repeated the extracardiac uh, vagal stimulation, and it was observed that there was a complete denervation of the sinus node, but there was a normal innervation of the AV node. So the sinus node arrest was, uh, the sinus arrest was replaced by a very long AV block with several uh, P waves blocked. So it is a very good example showing that it's uh, in cases showing sinus arrest. It's important to treat the sinus node and also the AV node. In this example, after treating the area of the innervation of the AV node, was possible to get a complete denervation of the sinus node and of the AV node. So at the end, the extracardiac vagal stimulation was repeated and there was no more observed sinus arrest and there was no more AV block. So 
the answer is in patients presenting even only sinus arrest in QT test, in Holter, it is necessary to treat the sinus node and also the AV node. So in our routine, we observe the sinus node arrest in, by the extracardiac valve stimulation that must be treated and also the uh, total AV block observed during extracardiac vagal stimulation and atrial pacing. It is necessary to get elimination of both phenomena of the arrest of the sinus node and also the AV block induced in the AV node by the vagal effect in order to get the end point that is complete elimination of the sinus pose and of the AV node of the AV block. And in this case, it's important to observe the treatment of the adenosine sensitive AV block that was described by the group of Professor Brignoli. Here we can see an example of the original description of the Professor Brignoli. In, in this case, I would like to show you this case, this case report of a patient that was studied by Dr. Uh, Felipe Hortensio in our group, showing that uh, a very important AV block that caused presyncopes in this patient after meals. It is important to observe a high degree AV block without depression of the sinus node. This typically is considered an adenosine sensitive AV block because there is no depression of sinus node. In this case, we perform the, the cardioneurobration of the area of the AV node uh, by control the procedure by stimulating the left vagus. It's very important in all cases of, for treatment of the AV, functional AV block, it's very important to, to do the cardioneurobation controlled by stimulating the left vagus because the left vagus uh, is uh, more related to AV node. So it is possible to apparently solve an AV block studying only the right vagus. And by using the left vagus stimulation, it's possible to reproduce the AV block. So in our service nowadays, if there is AV block induced by the vagus effect, it's very important to control the cardioneurobulation at the end by stimulating the left vagus. And here we can see an example of this patient showing that even stimulate the left vagus, there is a very long asystole because the left vagus also innervates the sinus node. However, by reducing the frequency of the vagal stimulation. In this case, in the upper tracing, we used uh, 50 hertz, and in the lower tracing, we used uh, the 10 hertz for vagal stimulation. In this case, it was possible to reproduce the AV block without sinus node depression, the same phenomena observed by Professor Brignoli and the same uh, AV block observed in the holter of this patient. So by using this kind of stimulation, we controlled the cardioneurobulation of the AV node area. And at the end of the procedure, uh, we observed that it was not more possible to reduce the AV block by stimulating only the left vagus. So the, AV, the functional AV block was completely treated. And the patient is uh, evolving very well, very well without no more a spontaneous AV block. Thank you very much. Those are impressive and amazing results. And we're approaching to the end of the second part of the cardinal ablation technique. And I want to ask you, for some final comments before we get to the end. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Zerpa, thank you very much for the her recent organization for this possibility. The cardio neuroablation is a new technique that depends on the enthusiasm of many investigators worldwide in order to get the best way to be performed. I think nowadays we have an easy way to control the procedure, a hard end point that will be very useful to compare several techniques. Thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing this time with Global Voices and congratulations for all the work pushing the field forward and for maintaining electrophysiology in constant evolution. And we have a lot to talk about cardinal ablation, and we're going to have a, a third part of the cardinal ablation technique. So I wait all of you for this third part. Want to keep updated? Follow Hall Radio TV on social media and YouTube channel for the best EP content. Stay tuned, stay safe, and wish you all an amazing day. Thank you all for watching.